Welcome to the Counseling Tutor Podcast, the must listen to podcast for students of counseling and psychotherapy. Here are your hosts, Rory Lees Oaks and Ken Kelly. Hi, I'm Rory, and with me, as always, is Ken. How are you doing, Ken? I'm well. I'm delighted to be here. This is episode 194 of the Counselling Tutor Podcast. We're super duper excited that you've joined us for today's episode. Three uh, topic points we're going to be looking at today, starting with our student check-in, where we cover something maybe theoretical, something that a student may come across in their line of study. And today we're going to be looking at Carl Gustav Jung, and we're going to be looking at his theory of shadow self. And then we're going to be moving on to our new section, which is called Focus on Supervision, where we look at the importance of supervision from a supervisor perspective. But of course, we can learn from supervisors Z perspective as well, getting an idea and an insight into what supervisors work to. And today we're going to be discussing the topic of parallel process. And then in our final section today of episode 194, we go to practice matters where we look at something we may come across in practice as as a practitioner. And we've got a special for you today. It's a peek into practice. It's where we kind of pull the curtains back and give you a glimpse into what it's like in somebody else's practice. And Rory, you met up with Tamara Howell, who is a very experienced over a decade of online and telephone therapy. And uh, she's going to be sharing what a day in practice is like for her. But we start off with that student check-in and Jung's shadow self. Yes, it's. I think it's a very interesting theory that always attracts students when they hear about this hidden aspect of ourself. And of course, of course, Carl Gustav Jung was a compatriot of, 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 of Sigmund Freud. And they worked together on the aspects of the subconscious. And they famously fell out because Jung uh, had a very different idea of the subconscious. He believed that we have a collective subconscious uh, where Freud believed that we have an individual subconscious and they couldn't kind of... Uh, they couldn't kind of make the two fit together. And it was a part of a, uh, a part of an ongoing feud that sadly Jung and Freud had um, through a series of letters. And our shadow self is that part of us that we don't like having, that we're maybe, maybe ashamed of. And I will share a little bit of my shadow self. I, I am a, a proud dyslexic, but for many, many years, I used to get incredibly angry and incredibly ashamed at the fact that I can't write properly and that um, sometimes I have problems sequencing information. And that used to come out as anger, or I can remember throwing all my schoolwork in the bin once because someone criticised my writing. That was my English exam that went, went into the bin. Um, and what it was was that it was, it was really my shadow self coming out. It was that, that aspect of me that kind of darker side of me, that which was which was coming out. And Jung would say that we all have a, a shadow self, a part of us, which, um, which may not be that agreeable both to other people and to ourselves. Yeah, and, and the main part of that not agreeableness, if that's a, a word, I've just coined the phrase, not agreeableness by Ken Kelly from the Counseling Tutor Podcast, is um, that it's unacceptable to ourselves and uh, the, the theory, the, the shadow self theory from Carl Jung suggests that this is a, a subconscious process. So it's not, we're not consciously going, oh, oh that, I don't like that. It, it's subconsciously playing out. It's part of who we are as a person, but it's something that we don't look at. And that's why he refers to it as the, the shadow. If you think of a shadow, it is dark. It is separate from, from yourself. Um, and we can think of the shadow of not really being us. Uh, so it is it is a a subconscious process so an example of this is uh, let's say anger or or rage a person who experiences anger or rage but when when they go into find themselves on the other side of of maybe being being in an angry spell they feel shame and remorse for how they may have acted there and what the shadow self tends to do is it projects itself in negatives. And what I mean by that is you may, well, this is what the theory suggests. Carl Jung suggests that a person who maybe struggles with anger and rage would say on a regular basis, I'm, I'm not usually an angry person. So they would 
they they would kind of put out verbally the opposite to what their shadow self finds unacceptable. I'm not an angry person. I'm not a racist person. I am not uh, homophobic. Whatever it's, it, it is, kind of, mm. and I'm not saying that every time one of these statements comes out is an indication of shadow self, but shadow self, the theory suggests that the person might verbalize the opposite. I am not, and put in what they may have in their in their shadow self. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 Jung came out with a wonderful quote, and he said, "Until you have made the unconscious conscious." It will direct your life, and you will call it fate. And in in other words, that we 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 are destined unless we unless we address and embrace our shadow selves, we will go around in a circle of um you know of of saying, well, I don't know why that relationship didn't work out, or I don't know why I didn't do better at school, or I I, I don't know why I don't get on with people. And it's because we're not embracing that negative side of ourselves. And I started off with a quite a personal anecdote. And I now accept the fact that I will never write properly and that I don't sequence things very well. And I just make a joke about it. I say, you know, if, if I send a letter to someone and they say to me, well, your spelling's a bit iffy, I say, yeah, that's because I'm dyslexic. I do my best. I use an expensive spell checker, but that's just how I am. And since I've been doing that, I felt a lot better. I don't have any shame about it. I don't have any anger about it. Um, I just, I just kind of, I just kind of a, a bit manana, a bit. Well, that's just how how it is. Um, and I think one of the very interesting exercises I used to do when I was teaching shadow self in class was I would get the students into small groups, and I would say to them, before you start talking about the shadow self, individually write down those traits that you find really, really kind of push your buttons in, in, in other people. And he'd write them down. Ooh, and then yes. I'd say, no, <laughs> no. And then I'd say to them, right. First of all, in a small group, how, how many of those traits do you find in yourself? And a few people go, actually, yeah, that, those, those are the traits that I don't like in other people that I, I don't like in myself. And, and everybody would have a bit of a laugh. And then I'd say to them, how many of those traits you identify in your partner mm. and the mood would change a little bit when people said do you know that's true and it was it's because you know we're, we can be attracted to those traits those negative traits can be can be attractive in other people so um understanding that we have we you know i i I think a good way of putting it is darkness and light. This is what Jung was really talking about. Um, we're a mixture of grey. It's just what sort of grey we are. Um, and understanding those negative sides of us means we can embrace them and, and manage them and, and be accepting of them. Nobody is perfect, as my as my mother used to say, Cam. Yeah, we, we, we are human. We are made up of many parts of self and... And I think what is interesting with this and what can be challenging is that it is a subconscious process that is playing out. So if, if you look to a self-development exercise like uh, Jahari Window, Jahari Window would suggest that there is a, a, an element of self that would be uh, unseen to self. So you yourself can't see it, but may be seen to others. So I'm just going to go back to using anger as, as an example here. So we're talking about shadow self. We're talking about a person who does not, uh, who, who would maybe say, I, I, I'm not an angry person on a regular basis. But other people that know that person may see in them that they do experience anger that kind of goes out of control from time to time. So... Sometimes with the shadow self, it can be seen by others, but not by self. That's the nature of something that is subconscious. It's difficult for us to see it. It's not within our awareness. And a way of maybe working with this is if, if a person, uh, uh, you're working with a client and, and they are consistently saying uh, something in the negative, I'm not an angry person, but that really pushed my button. Now, I'm not usually an angry person, but that really got my goat in a conversation. You may reflect that back and say, 
I hear you mention I'm not an angry person quite a lot. It seems that's a really important standpoint for you. And then leave some space for the person to come in because that can maybe bring something from the edge of awareness or into the edge of awareness so that it can then be seen and worked on by the person. And Carl Jung um, suggests that facing our shadow self is therapeutic. Facing mm-hmm. that unacceptable part of me is where the therapy lies because by understanding that shadow self part of us whatever that is and we'll use anger again so acknowledging and understanding that anger can maybe help the person who struggles with that to set boundaries or to to uh i guess set tags to know what to look out for when they find themselves uh, entering into an angry state so the work is in facing and accepting that shadow self, not facing it and going, okay, how am I going to get rid of this? How am I going to change that? How am I going to wipe that part of me away? Because it is part of self. It's about accepting the shadow self as part of who we are. Yeah, ab- absolutely, Ken. Well, well said. And it is a it is a quite um, interesting theory. And we do have a handout for you, one of my super duper handouts. So if you go to uh, if you go to counselingtutor.com, Find the podcast tab, go to episode 194. You will find that download waiting for you. And it outlines a lot of his his theories and uh, may be really useful for you if um, you're doing maybe a personal development assignment or you're you're just interested in a different view from Freud of the subconscious process. Yeah, it's a good handout. It gives a little bit of a an overview of Carl Gustav Jung. You'll uh, learn about when he was born and where he was born and a little bit about who he is. Um, speaks about the levels of psyche, speaks a little bit about the archetypes, which is, uh, of course, accredited to Jung, and then how the shadow self affects us, how that is projected, and then the benefits of facing the shadow self, and then working with the shadow, and then some techniques for engaging the shadow. So it is really a great handout. I'm very grateful, Rory, for your super-duper handouts that you make for us. They're free of charge. Counseling Tutor, click on the podcast tab. As Rory said, it's episode 194. That's today's. And go and download your Young Shadow Self handout. So there we have it. That was our student check-in. And as we kind of move forward into that focus on supervision, Rory, where today we're going to be examining parallel process. Focus on supervision. Yes, it's it's one of those interesting phrases that is always around the world of counselling and psychotherapy, parallel process. And I think sometimes um, it, it, it can be seen in different ways. So we've talked on the podcast before about a parallel process where you're working with a client and the client is going through maybe the same thing you're going through, maybe a bereavement, and you find yourself not able to um, separate your emotions from the client's. Uh, what's your stuff and what's the client's stuff? And sometimes you may take that to supervision and the supervisor may say, well, you know, if you can't do that or the bereavement that you are going through hasn't been resolved for you or or settled with you, you may want to refer the clients on. So that's one form of parallel process. And it was, it has been referred to in literature by H.L. Searles in 1955. But a more, a, a kind of, a kind of more contemporary view of parallel process is that that goes on between the supervisor and the supervisee. And it can take, it can take many forms and it may be that you're working with a supervisee and you notice that they may be saying, um, oh, you know, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling, you know, with this client that it, it, things aren't going very well and that um, it's, the, the material is a bit thin. That's sometimes something I hear from my own supervisees, but the material is a bit thin, nothing to work with. Um, and sometimes that is a, that is a parallel process between the supervisee and the client. The, the supervisee is reflecting where the client is. So in other words, um, if, if, if the client is maybe, maybe in a process of just gradually unfolding what's going on for them or making sense of it, and it's, it's, it's a bit slow, the supervisee may present that in themselves in supervision 
Um, and it's one of the reasons why supervisors will always ask how many supervisees you've got and keep an eye out for the phrase, well, you know, you've not talked about, should we say, Jane. And the supervisee says, ah, well, Jane's doing okay. That's the time a, a good supervisor will say, let's talk about Jane, because it may be that in some way the the supervisee is um the supervisee is not wanting to bring a supervisor bring their client to you. Um, and it can also be that sometimes supervisees, <clears throat> sometimes um, sometimes supervisors sometimes struggle. So sub supervisors sometimes struggle, new supervisors, with the idea that they have to be, there's an educational element to supervision. And what can happen is because they may have come from a non-directive background, um, there may be a person-centered therapist who is not used to giving information out, that they're struggling with that. And that can cause this kind of transferential problem where, where the, 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 the supervisee is, is kind of really, really struggling um, with their role as, as a supervisor. But to get back to parallel process, it does find its roots in transference. There's something that's being picked up from the, the client that, that then is triggering a process within the supervisee. Yeah, it, it, it's an interesting phenomenon, um, parallel process. And you're 100% right, Rory, as you're kind of saying this is linked to transference. It's linked to transference and counter-transference. Mm. So what is happening in parallel process is the supervisee, so the, the counsellor works with the client, the client is experienced something, and the counsellor in the relationship absorbs that, brings that into supervision, and starts reenacting those same processes that the client is experiencing themselves with their supervisor. So as an example, let's say that the, the, the client is actually finding um, the, 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 the counseling process quite frustrating and doesn't feel that it's going anywhere. Well, the supervisor, uh, the, the, the counsellor may come into supervision and say to the supervisor, oh, I'm really finding it frustrating working with this client and I don't feel that we're getting anywhere. So as you can see, the counsellor is now mirroring what the client is, ex is, is experiencing. Now that is the transference. Now what we need to watch out for and when it becomes truly parallel process is when the supervisor then takes on the position of the counsellor in the counsellor-client relationship. So if the, if the supervisor then starts working with the supervisee um, in a way that to, trying to ease that, trying to, 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 to make that better, they're actually kind of paralleling the process that the counsellor uh, would be doing with the with the client, and it can it can sound quite confusing. Even mentioning it, I get I I find that it it can get like a a, a blurry area. But the, the the main point of this is that it's almost as if the counselor goes into supervision to reenact what is happening in their sessions, yes. so that they yeah. can see how the supervisor deals with that, so they can then go back to their client and use that way of working or that technique. But this is happening subconsciously. The counsellor is not consciously noting this and the supervisor is not consciously noting it. And that's why we need to understand parallel process because it's a subconscious process that is playing out. It's transferential. It's not based in the reality of the relationship between the supervisor and the supervisee. It's kind of a warped version mirror of the counsellor-client relationship and uh, it's it's not effective to work with that parallel process. It needs to be spotted. It needs to be identified. A light yeah. needs to be shone on it uh, to work with the the supervisee in a different way. Yeah, it need, and it needs to be done quickly. I think it's uh, Delworth and Shut uh, Del Delroy and Del Delroy and Shuttleworth who who say that you should work with it in a um, in a in a most direct way. I think a good example would be you meet a supervisee and they talk about the client and they're saying they're a bit stuck. And you say, well, why don't you, why don't you try this? And they, the, the supervisee goes away and says, thanks. That's, that sounds like a, that sounds like a good intervention. And then you meet them again in the month's time 
And the supervisee says, well, I tried that and, the, and nothing happened. And the clients, you know, the client's not moving on at all. And you can hear in the supervisor's mm. voice that they're frustrated. And then what happens is, is you get this process of projection. So it's like the supervisor's fault. <laughs> you told me this would work and it's not. Um, and then you have to sort of say, okay, okay, let's just, let's just pause there. What, what's going on right here, right now in the relationship? It feels to me like your client's frustrated because nothing's happening. It feels like you're frustrated yes. because nothing's happening. And what's happening is <laughs> that, that you're now projecting that onto me as if as if as if as if i've got all the answers let's let's just take a pause and let's see where we are and let's see if we can step out of that that kind of transferential process yeah. and i think it happens a lot in the early early for people for people who are <clears throat> just starting out for new therapists i think that can happen a lot um and i think that Sometimes it's interesting. I was reading in the literature before the podcast, those supervisees who cannot understand the nature of transference and counter transference may very well, may very well not progress as counselors. They may find it, they may find it too difficult, but yeah, yeah, you, you have to be aware of that process, but that's an example for you. Yeah, thank you, Rory. I think this is getting clearer as 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 we explain it because it, it can be tricky to get get your head around it. And there's loads of, of, of very in depth papers on it uh, where you can go into to, to great depths on this. But you, you're 100 percent right in that there is an element of self awareness that needs to be present in the counselor who is presenting for supervision. Mm-hmm. So the supervisee uh, lack of self awareness, um, kind of may arise in in that counselor getting caught up in the client stuff because that's what they're doing they're bringing in the client stuff they're mirroring what's going on for the client and not seeing it as separate from themselves so how do we work with this as a supervisor well the first thing we need to do is understand it exists we need to be able to spot it Uh, we need to understand the theory of transference and counter transference to understand how that works and plays out uh, and how that works and plays out in an unhealthy way but also how uh, you can work with transference and counter transference in benefit of of the person that is experiencing that um and then as you say rory it needs to be pointed out and and it could be along those same lines you know i hear you bringing this client uh, for a few weeks now and that the client is experiencing a lot of frustration in the uh, in the relationship with you as the counselor but I couldn't help but notice as you were kind of saying that, it sounded like you are experiencing frustration too. I wonder how that is for you. Mm. Reflecting that back to the actual counsellor for them to then have a look and then go, oh, okay, this is interesting. But it does require an element of self-awareness and uh, the ability for the the, the counsellor to go away from supervision, so the supervisee to leave and be reflective, be able to go and think of that, watch out for it, think of how that is for them, maybe journal about it. Once that transference is kind of brought to mind, so it goes from subconscious to edge of awareness into awareness, it's there that you can work with it. And it can be a rich area. And it's interesting, once the counsellor is no longer feeling frustrated uh, within the relationship and playing that out at, at, within supervision, sometimes you can see a change in the actual um, uh, client's journey working with that supervisee. Yeah, ab- ab- absolutely. And in the case of the frustrated um, supervisee who says, you gave me an intervention, it's not worked, by by bringing that out and discussing it, um, it may be that the supervisee takes a kind of different tack that they don't feel as under pressure. I think sometimes a lot of counsellors feel under pressure to facilitate a cure, even if they're person-centred therapists, they they may, they want to see some change. And sometimes it, it lives in the relationship. And one of the most important things I would say is that is that if you have a good relationship with your supervisor, your supervisor will be able to hold you in that frustration, will be able to gently challenge you, be able to kind of, bring that that unseen thing into awareness and it will feel very safe to do so if you've got a supervisor and i i would i would hate to think there are any supervisors like this who are over challenging and and over direct with you it may feel that you cannot bring clients 
And and I a few years ago I did bump into a supervisee who uh, into, to a student I was I was teaching on another course, and she said to me, I I don't bring all my all my all my clients to my supervisor. And I said, well, tell me about that. And she, she said, well, I, I get challenged too much. And I said, well, I would suggest you speak with your supervisor. But if you still feel you can't do it, you need to change your supervisor because you're not in service of your clients. If you're not bringing your clients because you're afraid of being because because you, the relationship won't sustain you being challenged and the challenge isn't done in a way that's respectful, then you're not really doing the best for your clients. You may need to think about looking for another supervisor. And the other thing is, Ken, this comes up in our Facebook group quite a lot. And if you're not a member of our Facebook group, if you go to Facebook, type in Counselling Tutor, knock on the door, and we're a closed group and we'll let you in. And you can join thousands of like-minded people. We've got students, we've got qualified practitioners, we've got um, some supervisors, we've got a, a soup song of tutors in there, all talking about, you know, these these very... Uh, interesting phenomena or phenomenons um, that appear in the world of counselling and psychotherapy. Indeed. Thank you very much for that. And this new section, when we're kind of focusing on supervision, um, running parallel to this, counselling tutor uh, has a uh, advanced certificate in clinical supervision. And we include in that course online and telephone working as well. And uh, Rory was instrumental in building that course, mapping it to the to the required criteria. And if you're interested in perhaps exploring uh, training to become a supervisor, you can get more information from counsellingtutor.com and all the information is available from our website. The course is delivered entirely online. There is a live element of that where you will uh, uh, attend a live class, but uh, there is also a self-directed study element as well. But we do recognise um, that not everybody can go to a building and do the studies anymore. So we've adapted that to work well online. So there you have it. That is our focus on supervision going now into practice matters where Rory, you met with uh, Tamara Howell, who is very counselling tutor friendly. She's been around with us for uh, many years now. And of course, if you are, if you have done our online and telephone counselling course, then you will know Tamara because she has uh, been a presenter on that uh, for the last year. And uh, she shared with you some experience of being a primarily online focused therapist. Yes, it was great to catch up with Samara, as you say, Ken. Great friend of counselling tutor, a, a co-presenter on on the um, on the taught elements of the online and telephone course, and she shared with us some observations of being a really early adopter to the online and telephone counselling world, and uh, get up, you know, she she can peel peel the curtain back into what it's like to be an online and telephone therapist, and this is what she had to say. <laughs> Practice Matters. And we welcome Tamara Howell, who is an online therapist. And Tamara's going to share with us some observations of working online and uh, maybe maybe how it uh, benefits uh, clients and herself um, using technology over maybe face-to-face work. So, Tamara, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. So can I ask you, when did you start with online therapy? What kind of prompted you to become a, an online therapist? I would like to say I've been doing it for about 10 years, but I've been saying that for a few years now. So it's, um, I think I moved to France in 2010 and I'd been doing it for a little bit before that. Um, and the reason why I started was because I was moving to France and I wanted to maintain some part of my practice with the move. Yes. So I mean, it's fair to say that you were practicing long before a lot of therapists um, may have had to make the move because of the pandemic that we had in, in 2020 and 2021. So you're actually pre that you chose to be an online therapist. Um, yes. Well, I did choose, I chose to move, but I did sort of feel like I had to become an online therapist. It wasn't really something that I loved or enjoyed and it felt like a bit of a necessity. Um, so it wasn't a necessity because of a pandemic, but it was a necessity because of my particular personal circumstances. And I think that that can really affect how we, how we enjoy things. And, and I think it's important to say, I've been doing it for a long time, but I'm not sure I've been doing it well for a long time. It took me a while to get some training 
um, and put things in place so that I enjoyed it and felt confident with it. So you would say that training is an important aspect of being an online therapist? For me, it was. For me, it was really important because I really started to understand the bigger picture and the value and how different it is from in-person therapy and what I could individually bring to it. Um, And so I could not only understand how um, it worked for me with my lifestyle, um, but also how it could actually support clients and I think that brought so much more enjoyment to working online for me so although you you say that it was a necessity you 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 found yourself having to work online because you 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 moved to France how how do you think that the online world has changed in in that 10 or more years you've been practicing what changes have you seen um, well, I don't have to convince anyone that it's legitimate anymore, which is wonderful. You know, that's a real, um, you know, I would, I would go to networking events or I'd, I'd talk to people who would refer to me um, and explain about working online with video or on the telephone. And I think that it, it always kind of felt a bit like um, a bit second best. And I, I just don't feel that anymore in conversations with people because I think that everybody really um, appreciates how amazing it's been for us to be able to maintain our income and to be able to maintain the level of support that we've been able to offer to our clients through such a difficult time. So that's one of the main things that has changed is just the world's attitude to it. Um, and it's not to say that there won't be hiccups and, and you know, people desperate to get back to in person and, and, and things like that. But just to say that I think that it has really been legitimized, especially because there's been a lot of research about the efficacy of online treatment. And that has really helped um, also to give confidence to clients. And then just in terms of, you know, things like um, the technology that we use, you know, um, Zoom has become the standard and Skype was really just totally fine, you know, 12 years ago. That's what most people were putting on their websites. And um, it's not to say that one, you know, one platform is better than another, but just that the culture has changed. And I think that happens in waves like everybody will move to a new platform or everybody will start using electronic signatures or, you know, people will start using electronic health records and storing, um, you know, storing data in different ways. And, and so there have been all of these waves of culture change within the field. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the, the technology has changed. As someone who wasn't actually an online therapist 10 years ago, but someone who follows technology, um, I could I could say it's come on in in leaps and bounds, and I'm I'm really interested in in this uh, this notion of not having to explain yourself anymore. This idea that you know when you say I'm an online therapist, people go okay, that's fine, as opposed to what's that, or you know, or, does it work? Or I, I wonder how clients are reacting to online therapy. Has there been any change in clients' perceptions of it through that time you've worked? Well, I think, you know, 10 years ago, um, when I was working with clients and saying, you know, I'm moving, I'm going to be working online, it was it was sort of seen as like quite, um, quite niche, you know, quite specific to be able to offer this service where when they're not available to go to an office, they can still have their therapy, you know, Um, it was all very, you know, I'm not well enough, or I've broken my leg, so I can't get to the office. Well, that's okay, we can do it on the telephone. Um, And that was all sort of seen as very like advanced and, you know, and I think it's the um, norm now it's expected Um, if someone is running late or they've got a work meeting and they can't make it to an in-person appointment, they expect that they're going to be able to do that appointment on the telephone or online. Um, And so I think, you know, even if you're not an online therapist, it's important to have Um, some of those the training or the skill set or the ability the technology set up so that you're able to accommodate that yes absolutely and and there's been some recent research to say um, by the BACP I believe 
who have said that uh, when, when the pandemic ends and people start to re-engage um, in, in, in face-to-face therapy, that 69% of therapists will run a blended practice. Yeah, and I, you know, it's worked for me. I've, I've had a purely online practice, a purely in-person practice. For a few years, I had a hybrid practice um, and then I went back to 100% online. Um, and I, I think I'll stick online. I mean, I don't object to in-person therapy. I, I, you know, apparently it works very well. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, I, do, I do just really love working online. And, and if anything, I think for some of us, it's actually easier to achieve uh, relational therapeutic depth uh, when we're in our own environment. So for me personally, I think that it really enables me to um, provide something that's maybe just more comfortable for both of us when I'm working, you know, online with clients. Yes, the idea that working in your own space and a client being in their own space maybe makes you more relaxed, makes you, you know, makes you able to build a, a big, a, a better or a more in-depth therapeutic relationship. And in terms of that, um, how do you think the ther- how do you think the therapeutic alliance differs online than it does face to face? I love this question because it because it really appreciates that there is a difference, you know. And I think that what happens a lot of the time when we switch to online, what I did initially, was that I assumed that what I was trying to do was recreate the in-person experience with a screen in front of me. And it's different. The alliance is different. The connection is different. And the whole experience is different. I can't be responsible for the client's environment. I can support them with it, but I can't do anything about their environment. Um, I could. I can be more comfortable, you know, in my, I've got a hot water bottle on my back at the moment. You know, I'm in a comfy, I'm in a comfy chair that swivels round. And, um, you know, so I can take more responsibility for, for my environment and that, that allow that frees me up. Um, so how is it different? Well, I think that, I suppose that d- it depends on each individual interaction really and how we support our clients. I think that I'm probably provide a bit more support in setup and we get to know each other that way. I suppose the way we get to know each other is different. Yeah, the initial meeting would be more more about how the technology works and how to log in and and that type of thing. And and that would build a, a different foundation to a relationship where you just probably meet in a room for the first time. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I and I also want to say, like, I don't think it has a different quality to it. It's not that I think that one or the other is more real or, um, you know, more authentic or congruent. Actually, I really feel that uh, my interaction with people online is, is maybe where I'm most myself in some ways um, because I'm so, you know, comfortable at home. Um, so I really I feel that the quality of the connection, the quality of the alliance is can be the same, but just the maybe the way that we get to that is different. Yes, I think you've I think you've hit on a, a, a really interesting point there, one that I'd like to talk for forever on, which of course is 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 how the therapist feels um, in their therapeutic setting will have an impact on how they they kind of broadcast themselves for a better word to their to their clients it's been really really fascinating speaking with you tomorrow Hal, thank you so much for joining us thank you very much to tomorrow Hal, and of course to you rory for hosting that uh, chat with tomorrow and uh, it's it's really interesting when we get to have a peek into somebody else's practice what is the day-to-day running of somebody else's practice like and does it differ from ours so there you have it this has been quite an episode rory yeah absolutely we started off with a bit of a, a Jung, jungian psychoanalysis and we talked about the shadow self the the darkness that lingers within the light of ourselves and then we moved on to a focus on supervision parallel process um, working with transference and projections within the supervisory relationship 
And finally, we met up with the wonderful, the quite wonderful Tamara Howell, who talked about her experiences of being an online and telephone therapist. And as always, stay grounded, stay safe, and hey, join the digital counselling revolution. If you're a qualified counsellor or psychotherapist, then why not check out the Counsellor CPD Library? Stay current with your CPD requirements with over 150 hours of academically rigorous, on-demand lectures you can stream to your device. Joining Counsellor CPD will expand your skill set to create a more specialised, highly rewarding practice. For more information on the Counsellor CPD Library, visit counsellingtutor.com. Thank you for listening to the Counselling Tutor Podcast. Find the show notes for this episode on our website at www.counsellingtutor.com.